Welcome to your home hour, a program of interest to homemakers and their families presented by the Home Economics staff at Iowa State College in cooperation with WOI TV. Today's show features your hostess, Margaret McKeegan, and guests from the 4-H Girls Club. guests this afternoon were members of the 4-H Girls Chorus from Polk County. They were singing Dreaming by uh, Fanny Buchanan and Rena Perry. The girls are led by Mrs. Hahn in their uh, chorus activities. What is 4-H? Well, to answer that question, we have uh, Miss Esther Whetstone, who is the state 4-H Cl Girls Club leader for the state of Iowa here. Esther, what is the purpose of 4-H? Well, the purpose of the 4-H club program, which is a part of the whole uh, extension program, is to help uh, farm boys and girls develop a program of their own whereby they can uh, have fun and some work and some adventure in working out farming and homemaking activities and general community improvement. What are some of the activities that the 4-H uh, club boys and girls have? Well, there are, there are numerous ones. In the first place, we believe they ought to have some democratic experiences, such as uh, conducting their own meetings and learning to express themselves, such as giving talks and demonstrations. Uh, they need to learn the value of an organization and develop a worthwhile program of their own. And they need to learn to serve, to help other people, and to develop some leadership. Well, that applies to both boys and girls. Now, what are some of the things that the girls do that uh, are just especially for girls? Well, the girls, of course, have their own homemaking pro projects, uh, food and nutrition, home furnishings, and clothing. But they have developed many worthwhile uh, citizenship activities, such as the kind of thing we're doing right now in the International Farm Youth Exchange, uh, gathering funds to help boys and girls go to foreign countries and in return have others from other countries come here to learn how we live. Well, Esther, then, the, really the purpose of 4-H uh, is expressed in a nutshell in the 4-H pledge, isn't it? That's right, it is. Very well expressed in the pledge. I pledge my head to clearer thinking, my heart to greater loyalty, my hands to larger service, and my health to better living for my club, my community, my country, and my world. 
And now we have Julie Faltons and another member of the state staff here as a special guest today. And we have with her uh, Mrs. Uh, Richard O'Donnell, who is a 4-H club leader, a volunteer leader, isn't she, Julie? Yes, that's right, from Story County. From Story County. Could you tell us what the job of a 4-H club leader is? Well, uh, first and foremost, I think a voice leader is a supervisor and to a certain extent has the role of a teacher where she helps the girls plan their year's program so that it's evenly distributed amongst the girls, each girl having a demonstration and a talk or two and helping with recreation in each phase of the work throughout the year. Why don't you tell us, too, why you really are a club leader, why you'll give your time? Well, I've always been very much interested in 4-H club work. I was a member myself for eight years, and since that time I have served several years as a 4-H club leader. I feel that there is a real need for youth work, and the 4-H club offers vast opportunities, both recreationally and educationally. And for that reason, I am happy to give my time. Good How many evening. volunteer leaders do we have in the state of Iowa, Julie? There are something over 2,700 uh, women working in the Girls 4-H Club program. And all of them are volunteers to yes, do this right. because they like girls and like mm -hmm. to do something for them. For the and same kinds of reasons. Mm -hmm. uh, how many girls are there in the 4-H Club? Something over 23,000. Oh, that's a lot of girls. It takes a lot of leaders, doesn't it? Yes, it, it? does. How old are the girls in the 4-H program? They vary from 10 to 21. They may be 10 when they come in. Well, isn't it hard to plan a program to interest a 10-year-old and also a 20-year-old girl? Well, it's true. It takes a lot from the leader, but we have a couple of younger members today that the audience can see. Uh, one is Karen Buffington, who is 11, and the other is Janet Andrew, who is 12, and they're going to give a demonstration on making muffins show us how they fit into the program. The other day when I came home from the 4-H meeting, I thought I would make some muffins. I didn't get around to it, so I decided I would make some today. I got all the equipment out, and then I decided I would come over to see if you wanted to help me make muffins. I'm glad you did, because I think if we make it good enough, we could take to local achievement shows or junior demonstrations. Say, that would be a wonderful idea. Let's see, first we start with the basic steps for making muffins. Use a good recipe, use good ingredients, have it at room temperature unless your recipe says different, and follow your mixing directions very carefully. You should measure accurately because all your measurements should be level, and you should learn how to regulate your oven for best results. Then we assemble our utensils. If we have them all assembled, it will take us less time to mix our muffins. We have muffin tins, rubber spatula, mixing spoons, egg beater, quart measure or small bowl, mixing cup, a greaser or any means you grease your pans, measuring spoon, a knife to level your ingredients with is nice, a mixing bowl and a flour sifter, and wax paper. Then we assemble our ingredients. We have milk, egg, melted fat, salt, baking powder, sugar, and flour. Then we should have our oven lighted and regulated to 415 degrees Fahrenheit. Now we start our first real step towards mixing our muffins. We sift our flour and measure out two level cups full. We sift our flour, then measure it. Because if we measure it, then sift it, we will have more. Metal cups are, we prefer metal cups most because if you have the other, other cups and may have had something hot in them, they may have lost their shape and you may not have your full measurement. Having your ingredients leveled is very important. And you don't shake your flour and ingredients down in your cup because you may have more than one cup full then.
Then we add three teaspoons of baking powder. And then we add one tablespoon, one teaspoon of salt. We then add one tablespoon of sugar to our salt, baking powder, and flour. Now we have all our dry ingredients in our flour sifter, and we will now sift them into our large mixing bowl. A sifter this size is nice because then you can put all your dry ingredients into it and have it right in your mixing bowl. I now have my dry ingredients all sifted and in my large mixing bowl. Karen will now go on with the liquid ingredients. First, you break one egg. Then mix it. <laughs> Karen was measuring milk and she got down to my level to measure because you never tell her if you do get down to dry level. That way you really tell. Next, you put in your coarse cup melted and cooled fat. Karen's making a hole in the dry ingredients. <coughs> then I will pour the liquid ingredients into it. This way it will be much easier to mix. Next, I fold my muffin. You should be very careful so as not to overmix them because if you overmix them, you get a muffin that is real smooth on the top and soggy and rubbery on the inside. You should mix them just enough to moisten the flour. Now I have the, my muffins already mixed and I will put them in my grease muffin tin. You should take them and scrape them into your muffin tin. Due to lack of time, you will only make six, but it yields 12. There are many variations for making muffins. There are whole wheat muffins, bran muffins, and many other kinds of fruit, nut, and meat muffins. Karen is now going to overmix some of the muffin batter to show you what it will look like uh, if you overmix your muffins. If you scrape around in your bowl to try to get all your batter out, you will also have overmixed muffins. I put them in the oven at 415 degrees Fahrenheit for 20 minutes. Then you should serve them hot with butter and jam or jelly. I have a muffin that has been mixed correctly, and Karen has one that has been overmixed. As you can see, my, the muffin I have has little bumps and small openings on it, and the one Karen has is smooth and cut, usually comes to a peak. If you open them up, you will find that in the inside of these, the muffin that has been mixed correctly, you will just find small air holes. And in the one that Karen has, it, you have large air holes and tunnels. It is also soggy and rubbery, as you can see when she opened it, it, that it was harder than the muffin I opened. As Karen and Janet go on in the 4-H program, they will learn more advanced skills in food preparation. Now let's meet Arlene Steffen, who is a freshman at Iowa State College and has been in 4-H for a long time. I guess you're too old to be a 4-H girl now, aren't you, Arlene? Yes, but oh, I remember my first year and all my years afterwards. It's, well, it's fun to look at my record book and, and see what you've done in past years. That's a record of everything that you've done in 4-H? Yes, it is. Keeping records keeps us on our toes, and uh, it helps each of us to measure throughout the year and years after how much we've done, and it gives a clear picture of what we're doing. As, uh, besides food, you also had uh, other 4-H projects, too, didn't you? Yes. Uh, clothing, home furnishing? Yes. Uh, in our home furnishing uh, program, 
We learn uh, how to develop a better understanding for members of our family and to develop the needs in relation to the home and its furnishings. Well then, uh, adjust skill and refinishing a piece of furniture or making a slip cover or reupholstering isn't the object, is it? No. It's better family living? Yeah. But anyway, the skill is important. And today we have Bonnie Parsons and Pat Burwers of the Buena Vista Doors who are going to show us some steps in refinishing furniture. To redo it and refinish it. The first thing to do when refinishing is to select a good piece of wood. Make sure the, the wood is good so it will be something you will be proud of and be worth the work you're going to put in on it. Now Pat will show you step by step how to refinish. First, ask your lumber paint store to recommend a good varnish remover. To apply the first coat, apply it very generously, working with the grain of your wood. After this is set a while, remove with a cloth or a putty knife. Be very careful to use a putty knife, as you can very easily gouge your wood. Apply a second coat if necessary. This is generally necessary, especially if you have an old piece of wood that has been revarnished several times. Apply it the same way. To remove your second coat, use a soft cloth. We find this is easier and also does a more thorough job. Apply a second and third coat if, necess if necessary. Next, you rub with alcohol. This is to stop the action of the remover and also to get any residue that has been left by the remover. Now you buff with steel wool or sandpaper. This is to make sure you get all the remover off. Be very careful you work with the grain of wood, as this is very important to have a nice looking piece of wood when you are finished. Now are you are ready to sand. Sanding is the most important part, and one should not be scared to use a little elbow grease and patience, as this is both necessary in getting a nice looking piece of wood. For your first sanding, use a coarse piece of sandpaper. Since this is the most important part of sanding, be sure you get it very smooth and even. Being very careful you work with the grain of the wood. Next, you use a finer grade of sandpaper, working in the same way until you have a nice, smooth finish. Wipe it clean. Next, you fill all cracks or holes with the, with the filler. You can use plastic wood if it matches your wood perfectly. This is very important, so you will have a nice looking piece of wood. Or you can use sawdust and glue. We are using the sawdust and glue, as we find it is easier and also matches your wood perfectly. To make this, you stand in some inconspicuous place on the board and mix this with glue. Then you fill in the cracks. After this is dried, you sand it smoothly. From here on in, it's treated as new wood. Oak, walnut, mahogany, and chestnut are soft oak are so-called open grain woods and have tiny pores which need to be filled. To fill these, you use a paste filler. To mix the paste filler, you, mix, you thin it with turpentine so it looks like thick cream. Then you spread it on the board, working across the grain of the wood. This is the only time you work across the grain of the wood. After this is set a while, rub it in with the palm of your hand. This is to make sure it is all filled in evenly. Then rub with a coarse cloth. After this is dried, you sand it with steel wool or buff or sandpaper. This is to make sure you have a nice smooth finish and also have all the paste filler off. Now you are ready for your first coat of varnish. To apply this, you mix four parts of varnish with one part of turpentine. You apply your first coat very thinly, being sure you leave no air bubbles. We've found through experience it works better if you don't go what o over what you've already varnished. After this is dried for 12 to 24 hours, you sand it with steel wool or with pumice stone on a damp cloth. We use the pumice stone on a damp cloth as we find it is easier and also it does a more thorough job. 
Be very careful you work with the grain of the wood. This is very important. Then you apply your second coat of varnish. You apply this without thinning it. Apply it in the same way. Never stir a shake varnish as this will leave tiny little air bubbles that will never leave. After this is dried, you again sand it with steel wool or a pumice stone on a damp cloth. We have already applied our third coat, and this is our finished board. To get your dull luster, we sand with pumice stone, which has been dipped in linseed oil. This should make a dull, satiny finish. If you would desire a higher luster, you can use a paste wax, although we prefer the dull, satiny finish, as it doesn't show finger marks and smudges quite as easily. Bonnie, would you please summarize what I've done? These are the steps we have used. One, remove dull, dull finish. Two, red with alcohol and steel wool. Three, we sanded. Four, we applied wood filler. We sanded. <laughs> One week, or five, we applied first coat of varnish and sanded. Six, we applied second coat of uh, varnish and sanded. And seven, we applied third coat of varnish and rubbed to a, a satiny finish. We hope through our demonstration that we have proved that to renew it, we finish it. Well, Pat and Bonnie have showed you just one of the things that a 4-H girl might be doing in a home furnishing program. Arlene, you had clothing, too, didn't you? Yes, a smart appearance is important to every girl. And to attain this, we learn how to choose becoming clothes for the right occasions and good grooming habits in our clothing project. We include health in our good grooming project. Here are some girls from Boone County who worked on clothing this year. And the first girl is Ann Burrell. Ann is from the People's Peppy Pushers Club, and she's wearing a white embroidery dialect. Uh, trimmed with blue forget-me-nots at the neckline. Anne plans to wear this dress through the summer and fall. And this is Helen Hutchins from the Beaver Bluebells Club. Helen has been in 4-H for seven years. Her dress is a cotton-striped chambray with contrasting rose chambray trim. This dress will go many places. Dress up with hat and purse for summer and then for school in the fall. Ann Sowers, representing the Harrison Happy Hustlers, has been in 4-H for five years. She's wearing a cotton plaid, rose and blue school dress. It's sleeveless, so it'll be cool for summer, too. Well, besides the work in foods, home furnishings, and clothing, I know that 4-H girls do many other things. Yes, Rally Day is a big day in the life of a 4-H girl. This is our annual county business 4-H meeting and we elect our county officers and transact any other business. Then we have a program. Each club makes a contribution in music, folk dance, or singing. We pay uh, special appreciation to our leaders by giving them a gift or corsage, and sometimes even have a special recognition ceremony. Today, some of the girls from Jasper County will show one of the folk dances that we learn and often present at Rally Day. <laughs> fun for me. And we have Barbara Nelson and Mrs. Arnold uh, Harris, who have just come from the Boone County 4-H camp. Mrs. Harris, uh, what were you doing out there with the girls? Well, I was there as a cabin counselor, and uh, 
besides the girls having loads of fun, they worked at various crafts, and they did outdoor cookery, and made kaleidoscopes and pottery ware, and Barbara has several samples. Of Barbara, would you did. show us some of those things that you made at camp? Well, this is a head I made out of Mexican pottery clay. Did you bake that? No, we just let it dry. Just made it and let it dry. Yes. Yeah. That's a pretty good face, I think. Now, what, what are those uh, bracelets? Well, this is a bracelet. It's a box bracelet. Some people call them square. Call it either one. It's four strands. It's bracelet. Four strands of, of what? That's plastic. Oh, I see. That would look nice with the dress you have on. It's red and white, just like your dress. And this is another bracelet. It's four strand. Uh, it's a braid, too. Mm -hmm. It's a different kind of a braid, though, yes. isn't it? And it's the same braid as this lanyard that Mrs. Harris made. Would you pull that lanyard out? Let's look at that. Wear around your neck. just slides up and down. So you can make it different lengths? Yes. Well, you'll have to make one of those it. next year. Well, I've made enough. <laughs> <laughs> then what else do you have? Well, I have a letter holder. It's painted blue, and you've got a horse's head on the front yes. of that. How did you get that horse's head well, on? Well, that's just a decal. Oh, I see. You know, Camp you're flowers. pretty good at this. You could probably make those bracelets and sell them to your friends. I could. That reminds me of our 4-H personal account book. We learned to get the most out of our money by keeping track of it in these books. See, that's something that, that most of us grown-ups don't know how to do. Yes, yeah, sometimes we earn our money, as you have suggested Barb could ha may do, or uh, some, most of us have allowances. And this book serves as a good check to uh, on how much money we spent on candy and snacks. And this training is important when we have more money to manage later on. I've sure found this out in college this year. And it's even more important, I think, when you go on to homes of your own and really do have to balance the budget. I guess it happens when you graduate from college and can't depend on your parents any longer. Um, now, Arlene, that we haven't much time left, and I think we should give just a little bit of a preview of the State 4-H Girls Convention this week. You know, that's why we have this program, because it is convention week. Will you be taking an active part? Well, I won't be taking as active a part as I did when I was a delegate, because this year I'm just uh, going to serve as telephone girl at the main desk. Well, anyway, I'll bet it's fun to be mm -hmm. here and to see your friends when they do come in. Um, let's open up this program and have a look at it. Now, there's a theme for the program this year. It's um, you, a growing personality, an effective group member, and a responsible citizen. Uh, Arlene, what would you say that you got out of 4-H when you came to convention? Oh, uh, we have these discussion groups, and we learn how to participate in them, and we all have to participate in them. And well, there it also gives you a chance to meet girls from oh other yes. parts of the state, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. So that it's, uh, besides the girls participating in the program, they also have some very fine speakers. Yes, Gertrude Chittenden from the Child Development Department, and George Beal from the Sociology Department, and Edna O'Brien from the Applied Art Department are some of the speakers for this year. Well, that is just a very short preview. And then there's the Better Grooming Contest. And I think that Farm Facts on Friday night is going to have uh, some of the winners on that. Now, uh, on Thursday, Leslie Smith's going to be here. And we aren't going to can or freeze this week. We're going to talk about using fresh things from the garden. We're going to make salads. Goodbye. Your Home Hour is presented on Tuesday and Thursday afternoons by the Home Economics staff at Iowa State College. Be with us on Thursday afternoon at 3.30 for the next program in the series on canning and freezing. Margaret McKeegan will be here with Leslie Smith as her guest. The technical director has been Charles Hawley. The program was directed by Lamar Smith.